Hi, and welcome to another episode of Real Exposures, where we interview today's top pros in photography and filmmaking. Real Exposures gets to the beating heart of the artist and asks questions you won't hear anywhere else. Filmed in New York City at the corporate offices of B&H Photo, Video, and Pro Audio, we're sitting with acclaimed digital cinema filmmaker Philip Bloom. A pioneer in adapting bleeding edge technology, Philip has made commercials, corporate videos, documentaries, shorts, and recently worked on the Lucasfilm Red Tails that is now out on DVD. Philip is also teaches workshops, evaluates gear for Sony, Canon, Panasonic, Zacuto, and many other DSLR products. His website and blog, philipbloom.net, is a go-to resource for anyone interested in HD DSLR filmmaking. Philip is in New York City for the Vimeo Awards and had time of his busy schedule to stop by for this episode of Real Exposures. So Philip, I want to say welcome to Real Exposures and B&H. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you. Greatly appreciate it. You know, um, I saw uh, Red Tails in, in the theaters and I'm a big fan of, uh, of World War II. And there's a tradition I always have here at Real Exposures, I always wear a hat. So I, I kind of, I, I got a special hat uh, for uh, these questions to uh, take out a World War II crusher hat. I thought that might be appropriate. Probably do I need to salute or address you as sir? Uh, well, in the people world, I do have a rank of Brigadier General, but uh, since we're in civilian now, okay, uh, we don't have to, <laughs> have to do that. So, uh, Red Tails was this major uh, production that I you worked on. I can't take you seriously wearing that hat. No, okay. <laughs> right, let's no, no, keep it on. It's funny. It's funny. No, you keep it on. <laughs> Did you see plenty of them during the, the filming, the crusher hat? Yeah. I didn't see many hairdos like that, though. I have to admit. <laughs> Yeah, well, we're, uh, it's not regulation. It isn't regulation. I think yeah. they can get away with it more now. Uh, in the mirror, mirror universe, it could be. But uh. Uh, oh, you, no, you need to just have a goatee beard for that. <laughs> yeah. What was your experience working on the set of such a major production like that? It was my first experience working on a huge motion picture like that. So it was uh, really eye-opening and a lot of fun. Great hanging out with these veterans who've worked on incredible movies, uh, working with with George and all the other people at Lucasfilm. It was really fascinating and I felt completely in awe of everything. Having grown up with Star Wars and everything like that, it was amazing to see it all. That's, that's the grandfather, that's like the wizard, he's yeah. George Lucas. Yeah. You know, I was watching the behind the scenes video and uh, at uh, 141, you're biting your nails. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in terms of being yeah. in awe, I can, I can see that. Um, how much of the footage that you were shooting uh, with 5D Mark II actually made it to the final cut? Now, from what I understand, I think 150 of my shots are in the final edit, which is fairly substantial, because originally when I came on board with the idea of shooting DSLRs in, to insert into the movie, we were looking at around 50 shots, and the fact that three times as much as that made it in is, is astonishing. I watched the movie, I've not seen it on the big screen because it actually only just opened in the UK, it's taken that long, ah. but I have seen it on Blu-ray, and... Um, I can almost pick out my shots. I've got very good memory for what I've shot, almost photographic of what I shot. And it's a couple of moments, I God, is that mine or was that the main camera? Because they've made it look, I mean, the main camera was a Sony F35, which is an enormously expensive camera. And hmm. uh, I was shooting on 5D, 7D, 1D Mark IV from Canon, super cheap cameras. And you couldn't tell the difference between them. The way they've dealt with it, it's brilliant. Well, you know, I saw you, you know, working the freedom of having a smaller rig and working that. But I did see you one time getting chained into a, a crane. And uh, yeah, I didn't like that. No. I didn't like that. They put me up on the top of a, a cherry picker, and I don't really mm -hmm. like. That. I'm okay with heights, but I'm okay with heights as long as I don't have a. a, a, a the camera itself is cheap, but I had a. $60,000 lens hanging over the side, which isn't mine, but still, when they asked me to change the lens uh, whilst <laughs> I was up there, and my uh, my first AC, who would normally do that, was on the ground, so it's just me up there, I'm like, if I drop this, this is going to fall 100 feet to the ground, and that's a very expensive lens, so I was kind of very nervous about that, but most of the time it really was the speed, which was the key mm. thing, to give you an example, and it was a lot of fun, because Rick, Rick McCallum, who was the producer in the movie, mm. who's a big sort of He's the guy who's pushing this technology forward in Lucasfilm. Uh, so he, it was funny in that we were, uh, whenever, when we had to break for a new deal, which is when we, the, the scene was shot and we'd moved to the next uh, setup. Uh, so we had, I was mostly second unit, but I was also on the first unit as camera C. Hmm. So cameras A and B were the F35s, camera C was the, the Canon DSLR. And so I had a crew of three, myself and two others, and an intern. And, um, Break for New Deal, so we just unplugged uh, BNC lead. One of the guys ran it around there. Uh, the other guy picked up the tripod, we moved it, plonked it down. This took about 45 to 60 seconds. Rick McCallum would then shout out, 
camera T ready? And cameras A and B were taking up 40 minutes to be ready to go. <laughs> I, they appreciated that on the set, I take it? No, not at all. <laughs> 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 to them, yeah. That's I, I think the gag, the gag war thing quite early on with us being kind of like say, spent a lot of time hanging around and waiting. That's the joy of shooting with this sort of camera. Is it has lots of limitations. Don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but the joy of it is that speed. You can you can slow down a little bit uh, in terms of uh, may concentrate more on the filmmaking because the camera's easy to work with. Yeah, there's loads. Of, I mean, it's it's. Spot there, Far yeah. from the, the a perfect camera, but it's an affordable camera and it's small and, mm -hmm. and it has its uses across all different genres, not just narrative uh, fiction pieces like this, but for documentaries. And I mostly my, most of my work is documentaries. Having that sort of camera is wonderful. You can get to film in places where you can't get away with normally. Mm -hmm. it doesn't freak people out. You can use smaller lights. It's huge mm -hmm. advantages in many ways with it. Okay, I'm gonna just talk about something that's not quite gear, and I'm gonna I'm gonna switch off on the hat here and hot get to it. something I'm, I've gotten a little serious about. Um, now, I said I'm a World War II buff and whatnot, and uh, I feel that uh, Red Tails, for those people that don't know, it's the story of the, the Tuskegee Airmen and an mm -hmm. all-black uh, air crew that uh, made a great contribution to World War II. Uh, the um, I think that it's a it's an incredible story, and it, it went through a what I like to call a, a Hollywoodification, mm -hmm. and. I don't think it really needed to have that embellishment. In other words, uh, the German jets and, and the, did that, how do you, when you're on the set and you're making the movie, how do you rectify that? When you, do you ever feel that it's being Hollywoodified? Uh, if I made any sort of remarks like that whatsoever to somebody like George, uh, I think I'd be on the first plane back home though. But seriously, I mean, that's, my, my job is nothing to do with that. Uh, my personal opinion about the film, you know, watching it, it might, I mean, it's certainly not Saving Private Ryan. It's not like a gritty, realistic mm. depiction of war. It is a popcorn movie. And what it feels like is literally watching a movie that could have been made 60 years ago, or mm. you know, literally around the sort of late 40s, early 50s. It has that kind of innocent feel to it, which mm. is actually quite refreshing in its own way. Um, could it? Is there a market for a really gritty take on the story? Oh, God, yeah. I mean, that's my type of filmmaking is really, you know, really go for it. That's why I love something like Private Ryan. Oh, yeah. Private yeah. Ryan was, I remember shaking in the yeah. movie theater for that. That's a, a rare experience. So um, in 2009, you were invited to the Skywalker Ranch uh, to show off 5D Mark II mm -hmm. and 7D mm -hmm. to George Lucas and uh, his, uh, his cameraman and, and show off that technology. Um, that's pretty amazing. How was that? How was it? Uh... I mean, I, I'm actually really very, very disorganized and I get hundreds of emails a day and unless I'm at the computer when the email comes through, I tend to kind of miss things. I skip mm -hmm. through things like that. So basically the way it, it went down was um, they emailed me, Rick McCallum emailed me saying we'd love you to come to Lucasfilm and I, to come to go to Skywalker Ranch and this is, you know, for me to go to Skywalker Ranch was like, you know, this is Nirvana for me. And I didn't see the email. And then uh, the next thing I know, I was, um, there was a voicemail message from the USA on my phone. I said, like, oh, I'll listen to this in a bit. I got to it like two days later, because you know, it's all building up. I'm, 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 doing, I'm on a shoot, I haven't got time to catch up with everything. So I listened, to, time for George I listened to the voicemail <laughs> message, and it's like, this is uh, Mike Blanchard from Lucasfilm following up on Rick McCallum's email about coming to Skywalker Ranch. We've not heard from you. Uh, a reply, which was an email like five days ago. I'm like, oh crap. <laughs> so I was like scrabbling, like straight on the phone. Yeah, hi, hey, hi. Uh, yes, absolutely, I'd love to. And, and unfortunately, the way that freelancers work is that I was booked out. So I was unable to go when they wanted me to go. So I went to the production manager of uh, the gig that I was booked onto and did the old sob story, basically. <laughs> I pulled out photographs of me outside the cinema in 1977. So this is me at six at Star Wars. And this is me with my dad seeing Empire Strikes Back. And this is me, Return of the Jedi. And this is me with my lightsaber. <laughs> And, and she basically said, all right, what are you getting at? I said, well, and I explained that I've been asked to go to Skywalker Ranch. I said, is, it, is there any way you can let me out of this job? And she went, of course, no problem, I understand. Okay. So thank God for that, because otherwise, because that's the problem is when you're a freelancer, you take the work that's available and then great things pop up and it's like, are you kidding me? Oh God, I want to do that. Well, great things is kind of an understatement yeah. in that situation. Um, so, you know, on your website, there's some really cool footage that you shot around, around mm. Skywalker Ranch, which is, which is really neat. Um, one thing that struck me is, uh, you, so you, you shot 
one day you edited the next morning and then you did a, a screening in the afternoon or yeah I mean it was actually comp it wasn't even supposed to be like that they said we need to come along and help us get the best out of these cameras and see if they're they're useful we can use them so I said is there any chance I can just come like a day earlier and they said yeah of course and then I said as when I was there look is there any, I've got the camera do you mind if I just spend the day just walking around the ranch just shooting and they were a bit reticent because people it's not been filmed before and hmm. uh, certainly never been, 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 been put online so they said yes but okay but you can't use the footage just just for yourself so I went okay so I spent the day just walking around filming some stuff uh, did a very quick hour-long edit uh, the next morning after leaving at the transcode overnight uh, because they wanted to see some stuff on the big screen so I had some previously shot pieces to show them but I put together this little edit and that was the thing they wanted to see first off and I was like, oh God. you know, I was actually really scared because it didn't look great on my computer screen. It looked fine, but I could see the compression artifacts, I could see the banding, everything that you associate with an 8-bit DSLR image. And I was worried it was gonna look like on their screen, which is one of the best screens and projectors in the world. <laughs> and this is gonna look terrible. Uh, and the thing is, computer screens make things look, things look a lot worse. They mm. look over bright and everything like that. So right. they, they show up all the flaws which actually aren't there. So, uh, I arrived at the, at the house, the main house. Stag? No, this, we saw it in the stag the next uh, later on that day. Mm. But the first time we went into the actual um, the screening room inside mm. the actual house, and I was introduced to George and Ben Burt, legendary sound designer, mm. and also edited uh, a number of you know great films. And he said, and they said uh, we're going to have a look at it with George and Ben in the uh, in the screening room here. And I went, really? <laughs> I expect just myself and Rick and. And Mike, the post-production guy, would just look at it. And then they said, um, oh, and, and Quentin's here. He's um, just visiting. Do you mind if he could, he's going to come and have a look as well? So Quentin Tarantino, Ben Burt, George Lucas, Rick McCallum, looking at this footage. And I'm going, this is going to look like absolute crap on this big screen. And I just sat there at the back going, God. <laughs> and it looked brilliant. It looked so good on the big screen. I was like, this is the first time I've seen it projected. And it really held mm. up beautifully. And they loved it. And it was just like those terrifying moments. That's amazing. I mean, I, 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 you know, I guess only if James Cameron had bopped in would have been the only way it could have gotten yeah. a little more intense. Yeah, but he did probably would have walked out saying it's not 3D, I don't want to look at it. Mm. Yeah. But you know, with Tarantino coming in, that's what struck me. I, I mean, I, I love my George Lucas, but let's face it, Tarantino, uh, we're 90s guys, right? Yeah, yeah. We cut our teeth in the 90s and Tarantino owned the 90s and uh, his uh, genres. Tarantino is very good at uh, adapting uh, things that he sees and influences and mm. bringing them, regurgitating them and, and mm. putting them into his films. Do you think that uh, him watching this and seeing this technology and your time lapse style, mm. do you think that that will ever make it into a, a Tarantino's next project or? I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't know him at all, apart from that meeting there. He seems like a great guy. I mean, he's, a, he's an enormous film purist. He loves his movies, and you know, we, I'm sure I could spend days just chatting to him about movies. And mm -hmm. he threw that, you know, when he said, when he talked to me about it, said that was amazing. That was William Wyler esque, and I was like, fantastic. Thank you very much. That's a huge compliment. Uh, completely undeserved. <laughs> thank you. But you know, he's never shot digital. Um, he, uh, he loves his film as much as, even more than Spielberg loves his, his mm. film. Spielberg's only just done his first digital film, and that was Tintin, because it had to be digital. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if he will eventually. If you look at something like um, uh, Grindhouse, which he made with Robert mm -hmm. Rodriguez, uh, I think Robert shot on the red, I think he shot on the red, and uh, Quentin on film, and they both wanted to make it look like knackered old film as much as possible. Mm. And the irony is that Robert's look better as <laughs> knackered old film than, than well, Quentin's. I think, I don't see Quentin doing it at some point, but you know, if it can help him tell a story, and that's the key, that should always be, if it can help you tell a story, then go for it. If you're happy with film, then um, we, we, the thing is what we always want, and that's what I've always wanted all my career, is for my crappy looking video to try and at least look a little bit like that beautiful film. Well, I'll tell you what, if, if I do the next Tarantino movie, if I do see a time lapse <laughs> a portion of the film, I'm going to get up and shout out your name in the middle of the theater. Uh, speaking of time lapse, yeah, uh, it seems to be you're, you're you really rely on time lapse. Right? I see you do time lapse fairly frequently. What's with the the, the trend of time lapse? And you're, you're probably an instigator of this trend. But oh no, not me at all. No, I'm I'm I do time lapse mostly for fun. I've actually only ever done one fully time lapse project, uh, which I did for the uh, Crown Prince Dubai. 
um, brought me out there just to shoot his, his country a little bit. Um, most, anytime I've used time lapse has been in my documentaries to lift mm -hmm. it in certain areas. My documentary, my, uh, documentary I made, Confluence, um, there's probably about a dozen time lapses in there <laughs> just to just a sort of, you, you see them in, even in Breaking Bad, they use them yep. between right. different mm -hmm. shots just to break things up a little bit. So um, I do shoot time, so I'm, I'm nowhere, I wouldn't call myself a professional time lapse shooter. It's not like somebody like Tom Lowe, who is the god of time lapse, he's got his Timescapes movie out there. For me, it's, it, the, the fascination with time lapse is the same as we have the fascination of slow motion. It's what we can't see with our own eye, and that's why we love it so much. Yeah, it's interesting to establish, for an establishing shot using the time lapse mm. as a transition and also to educate the viewer to, uh, to the place itself. Yeah. Interesting. But it's great fun to shoot, but it's, it, no, it's, not, I mean, it's not fun to shoot at all. It's miserable, it's boring, and it's frustrating because more often than not, you screw it up. Hmm. And unlike a normal shot, you'll know it's screwed up straight away. This is almost like film in a way because you don't get to see if it's worked until you go back to your computer, build it and go, damn it, that didn't work. It's like going to the lab. And yeah, it is literally like that. Yeah. It's the immediacy of video has mm -hmm. kind of disappeared a little bit with that. And, and that's, that's interesting for me because I'm not used to that. We're going to disable your uh, your playback button on your camera so that you can wait till you download. Well, that's, so. what, that's how all my red epic shoots were. Mm -hmm. um, I did like a, uh, probably a dozen red epic shoots and there was no playback on that. And that was kind of scary. And they, they still came out fine. Oh, uh, no. a, oh yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. It's most of them, yeah. All right, so we're, we're talking about gear a little bit. We can't have you on here at Real Exposures without just a, a quick discussion about the 5D Mark II. Uh, the photographer, Sean Kernan, uh, had, uh, when the 5D Mark III was, uh, was, was brought out, uh, he sent me an email and he said something kind of funny on it. He said, he goes, is it me or is this Mark III underwhelming? And I, my answer to him was, I think that the Mark II was o so overwhelming that mm. it's hard for the Mark III to be really overwhelming as well. Um, but what's your take on the on the 5D Mark III? Uh, I, well, I much prefer the Mark III. I can't imagine myself getting a Mark mm. II out again unless I just use it for a spare time-lapse body. Mm. Uh, Photography-wise, uh, I'm, again, no expert on that. It's, it seems a lot better in all, all those modes and the autofocus and things like that. Just in video mode, though, it's, it's so much better. And that's the key thing for me, the fact that it doesn't have these a aliasing and wire these horrible issues that we had before which basically meant you couldn't shoot certain things they've mm. gone now uh, we have a little bit better audio and mm -hmm. other bits and pieces but for me the fact that that's gone is a huge plus for me because I love that full frame look it's unique and no video camera mm -hmm. does that no video camera shoots full frame video to have that in a body which is still relatively cheap mm -hmm. and with no image issues apart from our roll and shutter issues it's wonderful game changer no, absolutely not the Mark II was, was the game not changer. the Mark III. The Mark III is an improvement. The the, the game ch the next game changer, it's going to have to be pretty damn special to be because that Mark II changed everything. everything. It, it did change everything. Yeah, absolutely. It's almost like you can do a timeline up, up until that camera. It's one of those cameras that's... It, it caused chaos in probably in all of the major camera manufacturers boardrooms. It's like, holy crap, we need to do something now. Everybody's buying these cameras, everybody's shooting with these cameras, and nobody's buying our expensive cameras anymore. Mm. What do we do? And hence we have the FS100, the FS700, the C300, mm. the F3. All of these came from the 5D Mark II. Mm. Had that camera not come out, we'd still be in our old game. A great, uh, a great surprise. So you're here in New York City uh, for the Vimeo Awards, mm. and you're, you're sitting on a panel this uh, Saturday. And it's uh, uh, building your audience. Mm. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> 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 building your uh, I'm doing a number of things at the Vimeo Awards. I, I judge the lyrical category, which mm -hmm. is uh, catch for me, time lapse is, was a big part of it. Mm -hmm. and a lot of entrants were time lapse, and it's about sort of capturing the essence of our world, mm -hmm. however you perceive it, and in however you want to do it, whether it can be a narrative thing or just beautiful shots. And I judge that, and I'm giving out the award on uh, the new awards night. And then uh, I've been doing a little bit of a workshop about the right camera for the right job, which mm -hmm. is a key thing because a lot of people are obsessing over, you know, I must have this, I must have mm -hmm. that. And mine's trying to just bring, bring that back down to what's really important. And then there is that panel that I'm doing with uh, Blake Whitman from Vimeo and Nick Campbell. Building our audience, it's, it is really, and it's one of the things I get asked so much. And I, you cannot, we, we've got, uh, I think it's like a 90 minute discussion we're going to have and I get asked in tweets of 140 characters is how can I make it? Mm -hmm. 
it's, it's, it's so many things need to come together mm -hmm. at the right time. And I spent 17 years working in TV news and documentaries mm. um, before I started writing a blog. And um, so this is all new. Mm -hmm. This past three, four years or so has been you know, quite an, a fascinating ride. And it comes down to just everything just working together, where, you know, your talents, your ability to share, um, li people listening to what you want to say. Um, and there's so many different things. And, and uh, the thing is, it's, you know, my, my primary job is filming. I, I'm a shooter, that's my job. And I love to shoot. Now I'm doing a lot more teaching as well. So the split is becoming two thirds filming, one third teaching. Mm. And the key thing is to maintain that. The moment I no longer shoot anymore and I become a teacher, then the relevance goes. So I think it's important to keep that going. And so I, I keep my audience on my website, which is still growing, which is wonderful. I mean, I started off with maybe probably 2,000, uh, not started, maybe in the first few months I was getting like 2,000 views a month. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is fine for a personal blog. It's now getting almost 1.4 million. So it's grown enormously. And with that, it's grown the pressure of providing content. And I didn't want to go down the road of just regurgitating news, what other people are saying. Mm. What I try and do on my site is, for my audience, is keep what I do unique. Whether it's, it is looking at a, a new camera that I've had my hands on and being completely blunt and honest about its pros and cons, which I think has become a hallmark of my reviews and why people come back to me, as I hope anyway. And also just sharing behind the scenes of my shoots and trying to educate people on what worked and what didn't work and what they can get from what I did. So, I mean, that's really basically the core of what I do. Yeah, before you said uh, talent and share, Mm. So talent is your, your skill with the cameras and, yeah. and getting the shot. But then share is, is writing the blog, answering tweets, mm. retweeting. That's a lot of work. And it's... <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of work. It's, uh, it, as I say, it's, it's grown so much that it's become not uh, too much, but it is a very overwhelming mm -hmm. thing because I, I want to get it all out there. And I hate if I have silence from a blog because I'm on a shoot for too long. Um, I need to have something out there because mm -hmm. I, I want to share. And even if it's just sharing, just by answering questions on Twitter, at least I have some sort of presence on there. But it is, um, yeah, the sharing aspect and the shooting aspect, it, there's just not enough hours in the day to do it. You know, one thing that I, I've noticed about you is that you have an incredible discipline. You can shoot, get very enthusiastic about shooting, adapt the new equipment, all that. And then right away you jump behind a computer and begin the editing process, which is tough. That's how many filmmakers shoot and edit together? Maybe that's a skill that a few filmmakers need to have. Well, I think loads of filmmakers do that, and it's becoming a way of the market in that you are a one-man production company. Now, it depends on my work and what it does. I mean, uh, for smaller projects, I, I and personal stuff is always done by myself. There's nothing better than working with a team, without a doubt. I mean, the stuff that's got it, the most recognition um, has been part of a team because it's great editing your own stuff, but it's great having perspective from somebody else and mm -hmm. working and getting their opinions. Uh, my documentary, How to Start a Revolution, um, recently just won a BAFTA. It won Rain Dance last year. And it's all part of collaboration, and that's, that's what's wonderful. And the little other projects that I shoot and edit myself are great. Uh, but shooting and editing is, is a tough one because, and I'm finding this right now on a documentary that I shot, is I shot it last year, sort of around sort of October time and it's no longer fresh in my memory mm -hmm. and that's a huge mistake so that's why if you are going to edit your own projects your own work it needs to be done fast needs to be done that's the best thing to do is once you finish shooting get in that edit suite while it's fresh in your mind and start on it otherwise it becomes like oh my god I don't remember any of this mm -hmm. so, interesting yeah. photographers almost we want to work in, in reverse we need to we need to stay away from the project then get back in and do some editing step away and then even a year later coming back and looking at proof sheets or a, a folder yeah. of images, you see things you didn't see. Okay, in the movie, okay, so it's, it's graduation season here. Uh, it's the uh, you know, end of spring, beginning of summer. And uh, in the movie, The Graduate, uh, Mr. McGuire uh, says to Ben, played by Dustin Hoffman, uh, I got some advice for you, and uh, I'm gonna give you one word, plastics. If you could give some advice in one word to all the aspiring filmmakers and graduating students, and if you have to bring it into a, a phrase, that's, that's fine. But what, what would that be? 
If you, if you put it down to one single word, I would probably just say enjoy, because that's this is, I'm doing what I love and I enjoy it. And some, to be able to do that and get paid for that is great. But the single best phrase I could possibly give is is embrace your mistakes, because they will make you better. I didn't. I made mistakes, and I'm constantly making mistakes. And as long as you admit that you're going to make mistakes and you're going to learn from those mistakes, you'll become a better better in everything, not just mm -hmm. a filmmaker. True. Embrace your mistakes. Words of wisdom. But we'll, we'll tweet that later on. <laughs> So um, I'm going to ask you what's next. Uh, what you know, you're quite accomplished. You you just you know you rolled off at of this big production. What is next for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, I've got so many things I'm juggling in the air trying to decide which one I'm going to go with. Um, I've got a couple of uh, feature fiction pieces uh, which I'm going to DP uh, coming up the end of the year, beginning of next. So trying to get on those. Are these the zombie movies? I've got a zombie movie and I've got a, a Japanese ghost film, which You're looks fantastic. The genres now. And a, pot a potential comedy as well, which is so the third one on the boil. Um, I've got a wonderful uh, documentary about a, a songwriter that I'm going to start making in July, which I think is going to mm. be beautiful. And, um, and then I've got some more teaching gigs. I'm off to South Africa. I've never been there before. And I'm going to Korea, which will be interesting. North or South? Uh, well, I'm going into the south, but I think I might just try and sneak into the north, you know, be quite fun. Be careful of the mines. Do you think they're mine if I bring a C300 with me? Make a little film there? Knock about I, I would comedy. double up on the memory cards. Knock, <laughs> knock about comedy. Knock um, you know, it, it, I like enjoy. I think it's it's good to be Philip Bloom. You've, you've got a, a great plate ahead of you. Uh, you know, thank you again for coming to Real Exposures. We'll end on this note while we're still on the upside. Um, <laughs> So everybody out there, I really highly uh, suggest go to philipbloom.net and uh, check out the website. Uh, there's tons of great information, great clips. Um, he manages to integrate uh, very interesting blog entries with video entries. Uh, it's quite uh, entertaining and informative at the same time. And uh, well, thank you very much and uh, we'll see you the next time around. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.